All right, Poro, thanks for joining us, man. We're going to start off right away. We got to get you to give us this Poro Cop story, how the nickname came to came about. And uh, yeah, break break down that story for us. I've told this story so many times. I got to get my facts straight so people will start questioning me on it if it's changing every time. But uh, so actually, originally, the nickname Poro Cop was given to me by my roommates in the miners. Um, uh, a guy named Pat Canoni. I don't know if you're familiar with him. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I played against yeah, him so, in college. Yeah. Yeah. He was at Miami. Yeah. So, yeah. uh, Patty just, you know, we played against there a lot, probably. And, uh, I don't know. I just tried to make a name for myself, kind of run around a little bit. And he's like, oh, I think you should be the World Cup. And I was like, all right. So, anyway, the, uh, a few years ago, we were in Vancouver and like I'd already had this nickname and I just kind of like to cruise and walk around cities. You know, I think it clears my head a little bit and after flights and stuff. And I like exploring and a bit of a lone ranger sometimes. So I'm out walking around Vancouver. I'm in Gastown. Uh, familiar you guys are with Vancouver. Next neighborhood over East Hastings. You know, it's, it's a little shadier sometimes. But anyway, uh, I'm just like walking back. I, our, our, first, our son, Miles uh, Tara, was still pregnant at the time. And I was just like, oh, it's just a really cool store. I want to get some baby stuff. So I'm like walking back with my baby supplies through gas town. And I just see this guy like across the street on a bike. Like doesn't look like a stand-up guy. And I just see him like looking in parked cars. And this is like, I think the street is like, how? Like it's a main drag. And I was like, it's kind of weird. So I look over and then I just see him like pull something, this metal object that I've been just like smash this window on this car. And I was just kind of like looking around like, you know, I'll see that. Like, and like everyone's, there was a few people who just kind of like ignored it and walked away. And I was like, okay. So I kind of like start walking towards the guy. He's across the street and I see him like wrestling this huge bag through this broken window. And I was just like, oh my God, like we'd flown in the night before, like, you know, playing the league, like it's, I'm on like three and a half hours of sleep. And uh, I was like, I see all the across the street. I was like, dude, like just stop. Like I was so tired. And he's like, you know, swore at me. He told me to go away. I'm like, dude, just like put the bag down. Like, I don't want to have to do this. And he like yelled at me again. So I kind of started like trotting across the street. And I'm like, last chance, like just put the bag down. Like I don't want to come over there. And he like gets the bag out, jumps on his bike and like charges at me on his bike. So I was like, I just kind of instinctually, I just like sort of like wrapped my arm underneath his like little semi judo <laughs> tackled him off his bike. But like at the same time, and I had said this before, like I didn't want to like crack this guy's skull up the pavement or something. Like, yeah. so I try, I tried to be like pretty gentle and like, I just kind of like got the bag back and he like, you know, tried to shove me and like, I had him kind of like his head was down and he was like bent at the hips and I was wrestling with him a little bit and was like thinking he might pull a knife or something. Anyway, he did. And he just like scrambled, like got his bike and biked away and I got the bag. So he, he got insane. away. And I, I called, I called the cops and, and they were just like laughing. They're like, Oh yeah. Like you should have taken him down. Like <laughs> I was like, well, so anyway, I, I, some of the media ended up like hearing about it kind of in passing. I was telling the boys about it because I'd been at lunch with a couple of the guys and they were like, Oh my God, like what happened? It just sort of blew up. And then I ended up getting a text from the person who I got the bag from. And they were like, uh -huh. Is this Mark? War is it like, Is this Mark Warbieski, like the guy who plays hockey? And I was like, Yeah. And I was playing for the Sens. And I'm like, Yeah, we're actually huge Leafs fans, but thanks for getting the bag <laughs> back. I was like, Okay. It's so. so funny how Canadians have to slide that in there. <laughs> Oh yeah, I'm actually yeah. huge. This I was like, oh, <laughs> darn. like should, should, should I let the bag go? Like, I don't know. Yeah, but it turned That's out like, awesome. pass, like they were new to the city. All their passwords were in the bag and stuff. So oh, a shit. little bit of good universe karma, I guess. Yeah, that's like that's so good. Like, I mean, it, that's great for you too. But like, that's just a good story too that helps grow, grow hockey and like bring some. <laughs> You know, like it, it's funny, and I mean, glad you didn't get hurt or anything. But like, yeah, I, I think, it, yeah. and it's like it's such from reading all these these articles about you, and like asking some of the guys that you've played with about. It's a good, seems like a good fit to your personality <laughs> and and how you play and and in the locker room and stuff. So it's kind of just crazy it. how that cr crazy just yeah. how that happens. You know, I appreciate it, and it's actually like I won't go on this too much more, but actually, I've never spoken publicly about this one, but there was another one this year, so. So like the boys just go nuts now. And, uh, okay, well you got to yeah, you yeah. Tell us so this, you, this, this will be an exclusive for you guys. So it was actually the day of my 400th game this year. I was against the Rangers early in the season, um, and our son goes to a preschool twice a week. And I woke up early from my nap, and I was like, you know, you know, and father, like I want to spend as much time being a dad as I can. And I was like, yeah, I'm gonna go with my wife and pick him up. It was like three o'clock. Wasn't gonna go to the rink for a little bit. 
and we're just like driving in this main drag in Nashville and there's just like a car just stopped in the middle of the street and I was like that's kind of weird so like you know people are like honking at the car and it's just not moving so I'm like Tara like my wife pull up to the car and I like peek in and there's this guy just like KO'd in his in his front seat like passed out in the middle of traffic and I, I like I'm like Tara go pick up Miles it's like a block away let me out of the car get out of the car I'm like knocking on the window there's like people driving by me like, honking at me so like I like snapped on someone I was like like, like I was losing it like I'm not gonna repeat what I said the guy was like oh sorry so anyway I'm like knocking on the window the guy's like non-responsive like his breathing's like super shallow um I'm like oh god and this is the day of the game so I'm like banging on the window banging on the window he's like non-responsive I look in his car's in drive so it's a standard that's probably stalled but I'm like this is still kind of dangerous like there's a preschool right down the street so I'm like trying to get in the car, bang on the window, no response, no response. Call the cops. I'm like, what should I do? And they're like, how does he look? I'm like, not good, like drooling, not breathing very well. And they're like, do whatever you think you got to do to like fix the situation. So I'm like, all right. So like I grab on his door and I'm like, we've got to start. rip the door handle right off the car. So it's like something in a movie. I'm like standing with this door handle. I'm like, just like throw the door handle away. And then I'm like, what do I do? So I had these like little like barefoot running shoes on. So I'm like, I gotta kick this window in. So I just like haul off and just boot this this window of this car in <laughs> and like cut my foot up. It's not like 3 30 right, for a seven o'clock game. And I'm, my foot is like swollen. I like I like had to call our team services guy. I'm like, dude, like you won't believe it just happened. But anyway, I got, I got the guy awake. Um, I think he had overdosed. I, I ended up kind of getting him awake and like turning the car off and the paramedics came and I took off. But I had to call the team services guy and he's like, what the heck? Like, what are you doing? Like, just come to the rink. And I was like, I need you to come pick me up. Tara laugh with Miles. So yeah, I ended up playing the game that night. I played terribly. I got health and scratch the next game. <laughs> but like, I had such an adrenaline spike and then it crashed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. There's my other story. So now the guy's like, oh my God, like what's going on? Like, yeah. Well, good for you though, like to have that instinct to like, I mean, most people, well, you look at the people that are honking at you and stuff like good for you to have yeah. that instinct to be able to, uh, like it doesn't, it's not everybody just going to stop and go to their way yeah. to help, you know? I so. appreciate it. Yeah. I, you know, it's just the way I look at it. It's a normal dude who plays hockey, man. If we can do something good, do something good. So Yeah. And I can't wait because whenever your career comes to an end, the Ottawa police is calling you. <laughs> <laughs> my, my, my brother-in-law's a cop down in, in London or I was in the, he was like, dude, you kicked that open in, in like one shot. I was like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, LPS. Like, <laughs> oh, amazing. Oh, That's wow. Hilarious. Well, Borough Cop reinforced to say the least. <laughs> um, okay, well, let's uh, let's start a little bit back. We won't go too in depth. Um, but, you know, growing up in Ottawa, um, I've never been uh, fortunate enough to be actually go to Ottawa yet. I would love to make it. My buddy plays at Carleton. But oh, sweet. I guess like, you know, Growing up in Ottawa, I can't, we'll kind of bypass uh, university a little bit, but then, you know, yeah. playing in Ottawa, like how we just had Bugsy on kind of the same story, you know, Pittsburgh to Pittsburgh. How special was that? You know, having all your family and friends all the time, you know, just right there. And especially, you know, just that's your home, you know, like talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think you hit on it. It's special for sure. You know, I will say, I think I appreciate it more now that I'm a bit older and, and away from it than I did at the time. Um, I think I took it for granted a little bit. And I think, I, you know, I've mentioned this before. I think part of it was, as you know, or I was like, as you know, a guy in the league, a role player in the league, like I, I was treading water for a lot of years there. Um, I, I was like, how do I stay in this league? And my focus was just that sort of like those day-to-day -day anxieties of being a professional hockey player. And I think I kind of took for granted playing in front of friends and, 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 and family and, you know, being a part of this organization that I had worshipped as a kid. Um, so, you know, I wish maybe I had the, you know, the presence of mind to be able to enjoy it a little more back then. And, you know, I think obviously I'm in a different season of my life and a little more mature, I like to think. And, you know, I wish I had kind of those mental tools that I have now back then, if that makes sense. Um, you know, I still remember my, my, my first game uh, getting called up. It was a California road trip, walking into the room and it was like Alfie, Neeler, Phillips, Spets, and I was like, oh my God, like, what am I doing here? You know, like <laughs> imposter syndrome. And, and I was timid. And, you know, I think when, when you're timid in your own skin around the rink, I think it, it you're not going to be assertive on the ice either. And I think it kind of retracted from my game a little bit. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, I think kind of mixed emotions, looking back on it, certainly enjoyed it. It was special, but, you know, wish maybe I'd approach it a little bit different way. 
and then do like, you think? Or sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. No, go go ahead. Go ahead. And like I, I you touched on a little bit, but like you know, timid. You know, how long did it, I guess, take um, for you to fully? I guess it's hard to fully embrace, obviously, what you're going through, especially when you're in a situation like that with Alfie and Neeler and and all these guys that you idolize. But how long did it take for you to almost fully embrace what was going on and allow yourself to to become the player you wanted to become for the Sens? Yeah, I, I think when there was sort of a changing of the guard there, when those when those guys were kind of on their way out, and then these guys who had kind of brought me along, you know, Zach Smith, Nick Foligno. The thought these guys who were younger older guys when they sort of took over leadership and I was a little more familiar with them then I felt very comfortable and you know that's not a knock on those older guys it's just that was a, a generation a bit before mine um you know I think I viewed these other guys like Zach Smith as as friends more than these guys that I that I'd worshipped as a kid and um you know so certainly it took a few years I'd say three or four years you know and you know I think in some respects I, I've never really truly felt like myself until maybe even this past season in Nashville and I think that's just a part of, of growth as a human and as a player. And, um, you know, it's, it's always a process. I'm sure it's not done, you know, maybe I'll you know, feel a little bit different, you know, but certainly it took a few years. Yeah. It's funny. It's funny. You say that too. Like even just like feeling yourself and like, I, I don't know if it's maturity or like you said earlier, like learning the proper tools. Cause I felt the same way when I was in Detroit a bit. And I also think there's like a little bit of a weird, like that hanging on and that like, obviously it's like a whole learning process, but I do kind of think it is helpful in, in like trying to stay in the league because yeah. like, you're just willing to do like whatever. And I, it's not, maybe not healthy, but it does, like for me, I found that it, it helped me and I just didn't understand. And I get to now where I am and I look back at like what I was doing um, it kind of goes to like your one quote that you had in, in uh, the athletic kind of just talking about that, like mask you put on and like almost the entrenched masculinity um, yeah. that hockey brings. So like, I look back and I was like, I just wasn't being honest with myself. I was trying to be this person that I, I wasn't. And now I've gotten to the point where it's just been a whole learning process. And I'm like, I'm so much happier with everything going on. Hockey is hockey. And maybe I'm not performing the same way just based off whatever has happened, but my family, like I'm happy with my family. We have a little kid now. It just seems like life has, has moved on that way. And I don't know, maybe if it's similar to you, if you can relate to that at all, but like, I guess just like, let me read this quote. And I think I, maybe you can talk about it. There's this entrenched masculinity in hockey for whatever re reason, dealing with your mental health and your feelings and your emotions isn't seen as masculine. I'm a masculine guy by most people's definition. I got no teeth. I got broken bones. I got scars all over my face, but I still think dealing with my feelings and my emotions is important. It goes on a bit, but like, how long did it take you to learn that? Yeah. You know, first I'll say like, I, I I'm always really happy and, and proud when I hear other guys in the league and other players like you just say the things that you did, because, you know, that's, that's a tough process to figure out. And I think it's, it's hard for us our whole, and you can speak to this too, Ty, like our, our, our whole identity is, is being a hockey player. But I think it's important to realize that it, it's actually just a part of our identity. It's not, it's not entirely who we are. And, and I think that's why you're in such a better place now. And I'm, I'm not going to speak to your situation because I don't know it that well, but I can say certainly for me, once I accepted that, you know, being a hockey player is just part of my identity. I think it led to more success and more aspects of my life than just on ice. Um, so I, I, I always think, you, you know, when I hear players say that you should be commended because that's, that's tough for us. I think, you know, in the world, in the world we live in, but um, you know, on that quote, you just read like, yeah, I, you know, and I think to speak to what you said a little bit too, like that sort of like masculine fight all the time, no matter what, no questions asked, like that was sort of like this little like safe space that I went into because I didn't want to address the underlying issues, which were the anxiety, you know, my, my issues with what I now know is OCD. Um, you know, my way to deal with those negative emotions was to try to expel them through violent things. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Versus like sitting down and being like, let's get to the root of this. So I was just sort yeah. of like, like I said it before, but I'll say it again, I'm just kind of treading water. It was like just putting out fires, but not actually dealing with the root cause. Um, so I think that kind of ties into it too. I think, going with what you said like and it, it's not like everyone's story is different in that like you might grasp onto something that makes you feel like more relevant or more important and like 
it's something that people can like know you as, like you said, for you was the aggression. Like I'll be honest, playing against you wasn't fun. Like, it, like you were scary to play against, like as being like a guy who's not a, a fighter or anything, like there was that intimidation factor. So like that can make you feel comfortable. Correct me if I'm wrong for me. Yeah. I grasped, like, I went a little bit crazy, like, partying, and, like, I thought that these stories that I could tell when I was drinking and doing stupid stuff was my way of relating to the older guys or, like, yeah. kind of being that hockey beauty, but it gets sure. to, like, this point where you have to be honest with yourself, like, I can't do that anymore, like, I don't want to be the guy, like, sitting at the golf course telling stories about when I was 20 years old doing all this stupid shit you know and I yeah. think that can that can be hard to grasp for for hockey players but yeah it's just sort of what I've seen no I, and you know I think it's interesting you say that because I think it, it was probably coping mechanisms for both of us just sort of like manifest themselves in different ways right um and 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 for some guys it is trying to fit into that like archetypal hockey culture you know it's like I'm gonna go out and, and booze and be a beauty like 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 you said like this is how I fit in with with, with the boys this is what hockey culture is founded on and then for some of us it's i'm gonna go out there and, and you know be known as the toughest guy like i'm just gonna fight hit do whatever i have to do to survive that's my identity and that's my safe space so i think it's just you know different ways that those issues man, man, manifest yeah. wow that was that was amazing to listen to honestly that was uh <laughs> as much as i'm the co-host here we're, i think that's smarter was... <laughs> than, than, we, than we look right? <laughs> that was uh no but i mean it's crazy because i completely relate to it in a different sense i mean as after the accident I resorted to drinking and I resorted to anger. And for anybody who knows me, like I am the farthest thing from an angry person. Like, like I had one of my best, my brother's best friends by the neck and the slow pitch dug out because I thought he was disrespecting, you know, yeah. us, you know, but by no means was he disrespecting us, but like it just manifested into that because I wasn't dealing with the underlying issue as, as exactly like you said, but um, to switch it a little up a little bit. Um, I want to talk about, you know, being a role player. Um, I was a role player. Obviously, I didn't, you know, make it past junior or anything, but I, I think a little bit I can relate to the role player aspect. And I would love to touch on how important it was for you to have a team culture and have that foundation that you can rely on and you can, you know, enjoy going to the rink, you know, because sometimes as a role player, you don't get as much reassurance as I guess other guys on your team or just other guys in the league in general. And um, I mean, I don't know if it's the same with you, but how important was that team culture for you? Yeah. I mean, certainly when, when, when you're a role player, you know, feeling valued, um, I think is really important. And, you know, no matter what anyone says about, you know, sort of like external praise and stuff like that, you know, it, it is important, especially for an athlete, you know, you want to be validated by, by your bosses, your coaches, your GM, you want to be shown that you're appreciated. Um, I, I, I've found a really good fit here in Nashville. Um, where, you know, the coaches appreciate me and management appreciates me, but, but most importantly, my teammates appreciate me. Um, and, you know, we have a group here that I, I think is pretty forward thinking in terms of mental health and sort of inclusion with teammates and, and acceptance of teammates. And, and, you know, some of these like heartfelt talks guys like Ryan Johansson and, and Phil Forsberg and Matias Ackham and Roman Yossi have had with me, like these are, are special things that, that I'm never going to forget, but, you know, also in this moment that helped me kind of become the player that I want to be and, and, and and feel valued so certainly uh, you know I think you're right like having that that culture of appreciation it you know goes a long way for for guys like us like I you had there's an article with I think Tan is it or not Tanner Glass uh Cody Cody Glass Co it, Cody Glass yeah. Cody Glass yeah you guys were kind of quoted in the same article and he, he talked yeah. about the same thing he just said um how easy and how easy it is to talk to everybody and just how comfortable it is but like how do you find, like, how do you maintain that culture as a player, as like a role player and as a guy that has this background? Like what, how do you spark these conversations? Because like, I'll say like, I try to do the same thing where dig a little deeper, but it's also hard. You don't want to invade privacy or you don't yes. want to like pull guys into a situation that they don't want to be in or whatever, you know, how would you go about that? So I think, you know, the way I look, the way I look at it is I, I think it's up to the older guys to kind of set the table for these conversations. You know, if you can be the one talking about your own experiences, you know, talking openly with other older guys, I think it's kind of that trickle down effect where younger guys are going to start to see like, hey, this is OK. Um, this is normal. Look at these guys. They're established in the league. This is how they approach these situations and these issues. 
Um, so maybe that's the way for me to do it too. You know, I think it's a lot to ask for a, a young guy who's trying to find his way in this league and, and who's maybe not solidified in his career to all of a sudden put himself out there and be like vulnerable with his teammates or his coaches or whatever. Um, you know, it's tough. You know, there's just, there's so much going on in this game. It, it's super demanding in so many different ways. So, um, you know, I think the onus is kind of on your, your core group of older guys. And I think we're pretty fortunate in that respect in Nashville. Like I just mentioned those previous guys, you know, I'll throw Matt to Shane there too. Like we, we, we've got a good group of older guys who, who are open about these kinds of things. You know, we talk to each other, whether it's in the dry stall area, whether it's in the gym, you know, like we're open about these things. And I think it shows the rest of the players in the organization that like, yeah, this is important stuff to get on top of. Yeah. And like, I guess my question is, cause a lot of people, especially in the hockey world, I think the biggest fear is how they're going to be perceived after they bring this yeah. up, you know, and I think it's, it's so sad because I mean, for, for the most part, every conversation I've had, whether it be with other hockey players, whether it be with friends, I mean, I've never had a conversation where somebody's like, ah, you know, I'm good. You know, I don't, I don't really want to talk about this. Um, how were those first conversations for you? I think obviously, you know, we've touched on it being a, a bigger, tough guy and, and having this, you know, this role and everybody, you know, as you get older in the league and being a veteran and being a leader, you know, were those first conversations, whether it was with your teammates or whether it was with your family or coaches or, or, you know, staff in the, in the organization, like, were they uncomfortable? Were they difficult? Or is it a case of, you know, as soon as I started that conversation, it was just a breath of fresh air. You know, it's, it's, it's an interesting way to put it. I think it's maybe a bit of both. Like, I, you know, I'm not ashamed to admit that, you know, there were a lot of tears. Like, you know, yeah. I was, I was very emotional. It was hard on me. It's a, it, it's tough to take that next step and, and, and put yourself out there. I was, you know, first off emotional in front of my wife, you know, she was the one who was like, Hey, I think you need some help. And then, you know, it was my trainers, my, my, my parents, um, coaches who I trusted, um, and then, you know, when it came time to tell my teammates, like that, that was hard. I was very emotional. I cried in front of them. And, and, and I think in hockey, it's like, oh shit, like crying in front of your teammates. Like, no, nah, like you're soft, you know, like it touches on that sort of like entrenched masculinity a little bit. It's like, oh, like I get hit in the face with a slap shot and I play through it and I don't cry. Like that's just sort of like permeates everything in hockey. Yeah. Um, but, you know, like, yeah, it's, it, it's important to be emotional. Like if you bottle that up, it just festers, you know, and, it, and, it, and it's going to come out at some point and it's going to be even, even, even worse. So, you know, I think it was difficult. I was super emotional for a bit, but then I think once that tough stretch, then it was like that breath of fresh air. And, you know, I, I've said this to a few people. I remember the first time I, 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 I went on meds um, for anxiety and like, it sounds so cheesy and cliche, but like, I remember being in the backyard that we had a rural house in Ottawa. And we were playing with, with, with the dogs and it was actually in the summer. And I was like, shit, like the sky looks so, pardon my language, like fucking blue to me. And I was like, the grass looks green. I, I was like, this is so, and it kind of gives me chills just like saying that to you guys. Cause I actually like vocalized that to my wife and, and she kind of started crying and hugged me. And I was like, you know, I, I realized now that everything was just sort of like gray to me. Right. So yeah. um, definitely that's where that sort of like breath of fresh air kicked in. Yeah. Like you can't, maybe the old, you couldn't be like, the per like the persona you were trying to put off like give off of being this tough guy like you can't notice the sky being blue like why yeah, you can't no, be yeah. you can't be grateful for anything you can't show like yeah. you can't say something meaningful you know and it's just so for backwards sure. I think you I, I read something do you like do you write a bit or you try to yeah. do like a little gratitude thing or yeah I journal uh, a, a lot more in season um, yeah. then out of season, I actually used to beat myself up about that. Oh, I should be doing it every day. And then our, our psychologist here was like, no, like, you know, there's seasons to your life on a big scale and on a small scale too. So, um, definitely during the year I, I, I like to write and, uh, yeah, so that's, that's something that I, I actually recommend to a lot of guys. Cause I think sometimes you have these like abstract thoughts in your head and your brain turns into a bit of a rat's nest, you know? And then I think to get things on paper, sometimes you, you look at them and say like, yeah, this is legit or no, this is not legit. So I think it's yeah. important to kind of write things down. Yeah, you go back and like, it's also, it's cool to have this stuff documented too. Like there, maybe there's a game that you played, you didn't realize. You go back like a year or two later and you're like, oh yeah, like I remember that game. This is what I did. I like, I don't know. And then like, even just like life stuff to be able to keep track of things going on with your kids and like be yeah. able to look back and relive those moments. I think I agree with you. I'm not the best either with writing, but I try to. Um, but it is nice to go back and read those, yeah. those, uh, those moments. Ty, yeah, did you I, have I, something? 
Uh, sorry, I, I, I was just going to jump in. And yeah, say, like, give her, I, give her. I think sometimes that there's like a bit of accountability involved there too, because like, mm. you know, you know, for me, the big thing was like three things I would do every day, like three things I'm grateful for. And it couldn't be like, it had to be something in that moment. Like I'm not saying like, oh, I'm grateful for my job. Like, you know, that didn't work for me. Um, so it was like three specific things a day I'm grateful. And then I would say do one good deed a day. And it could be something as simple as saying hello to someone who worked at the rank in Ottawa, you know, like going out of my way to say hi to someone and ask them how, how their day is going. I think there's that sort of like that bit of accountability because it holds you to it. And you're like, shit, you know, I didn't do anything good for someone today. So yeah. I think there's, there's that too. Oh, my mind is, my mind is spinning. Okay. I got so many points that I want to touch on. Um, but even to touch on your last point, we brought on a guest, uh, Joe Hawley was his name, eight year NFL vet. And he was saying, you know, being able to do something spontaneous every single day. And as, as much as, you know, maybe not say, or saying hello to a, a staff member of the Ottawa Senators isn't so much considered spontaneous. It's still something that, you know, you will remember doing and you can be, you can be proud of yourself for doing. I want to go back a little bit though, and touch on, you know, your conversation with your wife originally. So I, for me, um, my billet mom in humble, when I went back to play for the Broncos um, after, you know, kind of seeing me and seeing me in this bubble and seeing me struggle in silence, honestly, um, she had to have a conversation with me after I stepped away. And she said, you know, you're going to promise me that you seek help. And I think those three words are something that I have really, um, I guess, held on to because that's a, a scary three set of words. You know, I need help um, for you personally coming to terms with those three words. Was that like describe that process? Was there an aha moment where it's like, I do need help. And it's not just, you know, solely for me, you know, it's starting to affect the relationships around me and it's starting to affect the relationships with the people I love most, you know, was there an aha moment or was it a case of, you know, your wife is the main reason of why you're doing so good today because she wanted you to seek help for, for you. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I give her a lot of credit for that. And that was it. You know, you hit, you, I think you hit it perfectly there. Like these, these anxieties and, and obsessions and compulsions I had, they had stopped just affecting my quality of life. They started affecting her quality of life. Um, and, and she was like, you know, like we just, like we barely speak. She's like, you don't, you, you don't tell me anything. Cause I was just so wrapped up in these negative thoughts all, 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 the, all the time, you know, like it just consumed me. And like, I would, you know, I like to train at home on my own. I have a gym, like I love working out. And I'd, I'd wake up with these like kind of like mini panic attacks at like three in the morning, these adrenaline rushes and be like out in the garage, like squatting at, like four in the morning. And she's like, this is not sustainable. And then I'm just exhausted the rest of the day, not speaking to her. And, and, and she was like, you know, I, you need to speak to someone like there's an issue here. It's starting to affect our relationship. And so that was the big, the big thing for me. And then I was like, you know, this is just not fair to her. Like I love and respect her so much. Like, yeah, I need to get on top of this. So I reached out to Jerry town and who, uh, was part of the medical staff for, for Ottawa. And he was just like a, a saint to me too. So um, yeah, that was just kind of a big step. What, uh, like you spoke about panic attacks at like in a couple articles and just now, like what were those? Like, I think just a lot of people don't know what they are. They don't yeah. like, they don't know what to feel like for you. What was, cause I, I've experienced them and it, they aren't, <laughs> they're awful, but yeah. I think for, for people it can sort of, it's different. What was that like for you? Yeah. Like, I, and, and I'll start by saying that, and my psychologist or psychiatrist here really impresses upon me. Like no one's ever died from a panic attack. Right. So I think yeah. that's an important thing, you know, that I try to tell myself and I haven't had one in a little bit, thankfully, but it was like, it, it was always for me, this like ball of like, like fire and adrenaline, like right in my sternum. Um, and then like my, my skin gets like super like itchy and scratchy sort of like weird feeling. And like I just be like clenching my fists and like feel like I just you know like restless leg restless arms like just that sort of like increasing negative energy and just it needed somewhere to go right so um that was typically what mine were like and you know I I, I had one during a game uh well, yeah. two years ago in Nashville after fighting Pat Maroon and it, or I took a penalty and then I ended up fighting Pat Maroon because like I just had to get that out of me I ended up taking it on sportsman like because I pulled him down the ice and soccered him because I just had so much negative energy that I needed to like somehow expel from me and it was a product of that panic attacks yeah that's crazy that's brutal i mean i like i've had one i remember having one i actually had one when i was in detroit i was having a really shitty year i had one right before the game in uh in edmonton and we went out we played like i'm going for warm-ups and you know like eventually things settled down 
go out for yeah. warm-ups. I didn't really remember taking warm-ups or anything, go out and start playing. I think in the first period, I go to, I'm like protecting the puck in our D zone and I go to like go high off the glass. I miss the glass, goes right into our bench and hits Jeff Blaschel right <laughs> between the eyes. Like bad like, cut, like both, like two black eyes. And I'm like, okay, well, that's, that's great. <laughs> just coming <laughs> off a panic attack, just hit my coach in the face with a puck, like yeah. just bench me. <laughs> yeah. So. I, I mean, I do think it's important to look back on them and like chuckle a little bit sometimes, you know, cause like it, it takes some of the, like, I think there's like extra seriousness. You build up into them away a little bit. It's like, Hey, like I went through this, I survived, like listen to this hilarious stuff that happened, you know? So yeah, yeah I, I do think it's a good way to approach it. And I think too, like you, what you said, if kind of your positive, positive experience with Nashville and Ottawa it should give people I mean it definitely gives you I think some like feeling of like just being you can be calm you can relieve some of that pressure knowing I think this can tie into another question that I have but like that feeling where you have to go out and play like you you have like that I feel like that pressure is so terrible that you have to play like you lose that that side of like how much you love the game because it's your job and you have all these you have this weird relationship to the sport once it becomes so serious but like that feeling for me i found that i have to go to practice i have to go to train i have to do all this stuff you i i read part of an article it just says like looking at your challenges as obstacles rather than opportunities is where you started to it was like a little bit of a light bulb moment where I look at, I use the words like get to versus have to. If I can wake up yeah. in the morning, I can be like, okay, I get to go to practice today. I get to have my pregame nap. I get to eat, wake up and go to the game, whatever. I find that changes my, my like thinking pattern a bit where it provides me with a little more excitement. Um, yeah. I don't know if that's something that's relatable to you, but I think that's kind of what I got from that article. Yeah, and that's 100%. It's like the exact way. Um, it was a, a sports psychologist that I was working with in Montreal. Um, his name is Jean-Francois Menard, and uh, he works with a lot of Canadian Olympians. And he, he had said that to me. He's like, you know, you need to use, like, like look at a conditioning skate in the summer. Like, that's an opportunity to, like, to, to show yourself, to show teammates that you're in the best shape, you know, um, hard practice. That's an opportunity to, like, prove to yourself that, like, hey, I can do this. Um, and, 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 like, hey, like, I still struggle with that a lot. You're bang on. Mm -hmm. When January, February rolls around, you just you just come through the All Star break. You're like, this is going to be a grind. You're banged up. Like, it's tough sometimes. You know, it, it really is hard. And I think, especially as a role player too, it's like, I think it's easy to fall into this trap of, you're like, you view a game and you're like, oh, I hope I don't make a mistake tonight that hurts the team. Versus like, I'm going to go out there and help the team. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think I still get sucked into that a lot. You know, I say, okay, I'm playing 15 minutes tonight. Man, I don't want to be the guy who costs the goal. But like when you, when you go out there with that mentality, like you're not, you're not going to play to your potential. Like you might play well and survive. Sure. But you're not going to be your best. And I think when I'm at my best, it's like, as a defensive guy, I'm not in this mindset where I'm like, Oh, I have the puck. I better not make a mistake. It's like, Hey, I have the puck. Like I'm going to do something impactful. Here. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think it all kind of ties into that mentality you said of like half you got to versus like, or like, you know, playing to not make a mistake versus playing to win. Yeah. Isn't it crazy that it's not like a focus from like an organizational standpoint, like, yeah. because the difference physically is like, I mean, obviously you have your outliers that are just ridiculously small and good or ridiculously big and strong and good. But like, yeah. I feel like across the board, like everyone is very skilled and capable, mm. but it's the mind that like, you know, that is, I feel like the biggest factor and lack of confidence. And, and it's sure. just like, I think it's going to change where there's going to be more of a, um, an effort to be like cognizant of how guys are feeling, but it's just yeah. crazy that like, it's going to happen soon, I think, but like this conversation, why isn't everybody in the locker room yeah. thinking that they get to go to practice today? Like, why isn't yeah. that the app, you know, like, why isn't that just built into your, because it is like, it's a thinking pattern and the stronger you build those habits, the strong, like it's easier to pick up on. But when you yeah. come off the ice and you're the only one thinking that way and you have your whole team, that's like, Oh God, we got a bag skate again today or whatever. Yeah. 
then it's hard to stay consistent with it. So for sure. I no, and you know, I, I think you're bang on. Like I think I think you're leaving a lot on the table as let's say you're 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 a GM or part of management or a coach. Like, you know, it's like you said, like like the physical attributes of this game, like we're all so close. We we were all skilled guys at our level before we made it to the NHL. Like like boys, I was playing the power play in college. I was taking face offs. <laughs> you know? Like it. I had like eight goals in the NCAA like my last year as a defenseman. Like, you know, like we're all skilled yeah. guys, like despite what some people may want to think about us, like, you know, <laughs> and it's like, yeah, I can score lacrosse goal in practice. Like, <laughs> you know, like we're all pretty skilled. Yeah. But you know, it's like, like this man, it's like this mentality thing. And 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 I think you're just bang on. In, in, in so many different ways and i you know i think from like a management standpoint it's like why why would you not want to maximize your team's ability through the mental side of the game too and you know do i think maybe that's the right way to that we need to approach like mental health issues in sport no but if it moves the needle in a positive direction a little bit yeah. if a team's like hey like i can maximize my production for dollar of a player if i get them in, in a good place mentally like is that the right approach probably not but is it going to help the situation incrementally like sure so yeah. uh, you know i think even if you look at it that way I, I just i don't know why more teams aren't like hey this is an opportunity for us to get some more results and, and, and more production out of the players yeah and i think uh instantly what thought my thought that came to my mind was i think as hockey players it's all about self-esteem i think it's just like directly related to confidence directly related to self-esteem and actually one day one of my uh, good buddies sent me an article about self-compassion and I was like, yeah. first off, I never even really heard of self-compassion. You know, it's usually just compassion or it's usually just self-esteem. But this article goes into, you know, how important it is to have that compassion for yourself when you go out and make a mistake. And obviously, you know, there is residual effects sometimes in the NHL or just in any sport you play. But, you know, to have that self-compassion and to help yourself understand that this is just a tiny blip in the road and this is a tiny mistake and you can overcome this and you still get to do what you love. I think that's the biggest thing that I took from that conversation, but I want to definitely touch on, you know, as you're embarking on this journey and as you're putting more of a focus on your mental side, on your mental state and on, you know, having this mentality of, I get to do this and this is amazing, you know, and I'm going to take this opportunity when you look back on that journey as well, what is, you know, one major misconception you had? I don't know if it stems from being a hockey player, if it stems from being a male, if it stems from, you know, was, because I know for me, there were so many misconceptions I had, whether it was, you know, weakness, shame, if you're going to open up, whether it's, you know, you can't, I don't know, there's so many misconceptions that I just personally had. And I'd love to know if there's any that come to mind as you reflect back on, you know, before you started to embark on this mental journey. Yeah. You know, I, I think there's a couple and, you know, I think first off, it was just not, it was just, you know, thinking that getting help was a sign of weakness. And, you know, I, I know everyone, like everyone says that because it, it's true and it's so pertinent, like, you know, like being open and vulnerable, it's, it's not, it's not weakness. Like, I know we keep saying this over and over, but it's truly not like it's strength and it's, 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 you know, honesty with yourself and with those around you. So I think, you know, I wish I'd kind of taken that that step earlier and not been like, well, you know, I'm a fighter in the league. Like oh, I can't deal with my emotions. Like, um, so I think that's a huge one for me. And then, you know, I, I think what we just touched on and because I, I still do struggle with this, it's like, you know, I look back on this one season I had in Ottawa, like before I went to Nashville, I had seven goals and 11 assists as a third pairing defenseman. And I'm like, you know, I'm trying to think back, like what were my, what was my state of mind? And it was, it was like, you know, first off, I was playing because I was kind of like an F you to Ottawa. Like, you, you don't want me around. Like, I'm going to play with a chip on my shoulder. But the other one was like that that idea of like, I actually like, that was the year for me where like, I, I wanted the puck every shift. I was like, I want to be a difference maker. I want to contribute. And I still kind of slip into that idea of wa not wanting to be the guy to make a mistake. And, and I think that's an important thing for a lot of guys in the sport to realize. Like, it, it's tough because it is such a game of mistakes. But like, you know, mi mistakes happen. You still just have to go out there and play to be an impactful player, and play to win and play to help your team. So I think that's one sort of like, I don't know if misconception, I don't know if it really answers your question, doesn't fit into the misconception, but I think that's sort of like one sort of mindset thing that I still struggle with that I wish I'd kind of recognized earlier and, and could recognize a little more consistently. Yeah, that yeah, that hundred percent makes sense. And I, I think it's as much as you yeah, people may not classify as it a misconception. It still completely makes sense. Um, yes. I think I got 
I got one more little question as well. Um, there's quite a bit of in the articles that we read about, you know, that year, um, that year for you with the concussion with, you know, COVID. Um, yeah. As you know, you look back and as it's, it's obviously a very difficult year to process and, and look back and reflect on. Um, I kind of related to just COVID for a lot of people as well. So much time with your own thoughts, so much time with, you know, just in your own mind. When you look back, like, you know, was there anything that you really started to improve upon or learn about yourself as you went through a very difficult year, um, not just for yourself, but for your family as well? Yeah, I, you know, I think it for me, it was like, do I do I still love this game, the sport and playing it? Um, you know, like I trained my ass off during that pause. I was coming to Nashville. I was so jacked up to get here. Uh, like right before training camp, COVID, bam, like my lungs were fried. Like I got, I, I got rocked. Like my lower back was destroyed. Like I came back on the ice and just didn't feel like a player, you know? Um, and then I get those, I get like back-to-back subsequent concussions. And it was like, I started to feel good. Every time I'd work out, I'd be like throwing up dizzy. And that went on for like five, six months. And, and it kind of makes you question like, like, do I want to climb this mountain again? Like, how much do I actually love this sport? Like, do I miss it? Um, and I think having that chance to sort of like step back and be with my family, you know, and have some pretty candid conversations with my wife, Tara, I was like, yeah, you know, like, I, I do still love this sport. Like, so I, th- I think it was a bit of a reset for me. So yeah, it was a negative year, but I think, you know, in the grand scheme of things, I think it ended up becoming a positive because it made me realize like, hey, I do want to come play. I do want to contribute to this team, this organization. And, and I still do love being a hockey player. And you know, identifying as a hockey player. So, um, yeah, that was kind of the big one. I got a question that'll kind of, t- I hate to put you on the spot because this is a hard no, question. No, no, answer. No I'm easy, um, yeah. um, I heard, I listened to a podcast. I've talked to Ty about this part, the, this episode is with, uh, it's called the Ed Milet show is with Brett Eldridge, the country music singer. Yeah. Um, and he asked him like where you are now is, is it everything you thought it was going to be as a young kid, like growing up, dreaming of, of playing in the NHL? Like, how would you answer that question? Uh, well, I think when I was a kid, I was like, oh, I'm going to find my parents like Mercedes. And <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a little bit different in the material. Uh, yeah. Um, you know, I, I think back then, maybe you're a little bit naive, you know, you just see the good, um, which I think is a great, I, you know, I think that's the way kids should think, you know, you shouldn't be thinking of this stuff at that age. So, um, but you know, and, and I don't want to make, I don't want to make this like a pity party or anything because like, you know, we live a very privileged life. Like I'm incredibly grateful, but like this, this job is, is, is demanding. It's, it, it's hard on you physically, you know, like I'm probably gonna have arthritis in my hands when I'm like 45. You know? it, it's, it's hard on you physically, but it's, I think it's even more of a drain on you mentally and emotionally. Um, I think that's something that I, I, you know, rightfully didn't know or understand at that point. But, you know, having said that, um, you know, we, we play in the NHL, like not a lot of people get, get, get to say that we're the 1% of, 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 of hockey players. And, um, so I think it's important to kind of take stock of how far you've come and what you've actually accomplished. And, you know, regardless of how many games you end up playing in, the, in this league, you know, you've accomplished something special. So. Yeah, you know, I, I was a bit of a fence sitting answer there, but uh, no, it's right, it, it, two it, sides it. it's so true though, and I think a lot of guys lose sight on it. Like when I thought when I heard that, and I thought about it, I was like, like, is this everything I thought of when I was younger? Even when I got older and was working to play in the NHL in college, whatever, you just think of like scoring the big goal or the attention that comes with with being an NHL player and you get that when you turn pro and it's, it's unbelievable and you can kind of ride that high for a bit, but like now I think like for me to be able to do this, start a podcast or to be able to speak about like mental health and maybe help someone get through their day. And then you hear about that. Like I left the arena for the last game at home um, before the end of the season. And I was the last one out by at least 20 minutes or so. And there's still like a pool of like 10 or 15 people waiting for autographs. I was like, they got to know most of the guys are gone. Like I haven't like, nobody wants my autograph, whatever. But then like eight of them came up to the window and they were like, Oh, Riley, like you're like, we are waiting for you. Like, thank you so much for the podcast. Like we love what you're doing. Like I actually started going back to therapy because 
um, of like the message that you're sending. So it's like you have to sort of transform your your reason as to why you're playing, right? And I think that's like a very mature way of looking at things. I think like what you do with like speaking out with the quality stuff and some of the LGBTQ stuff and um, anything that you can get your hands on. I read the story about when you you reached out to um, Morissette from Sportsnet. I forget Justin, maybe yeah. I forget his first. Yeah, Justin, yeah. You have like you have the ability to do that now because you've earned you've earned this however many years of playing in the NHL, you know? Yeah. So I just, that's an interesting question. I like to ask guys because it, it is hard. Like as you get to the end of your career, like a lot of guys are just playing for the paycheck and they yeah. forget they, they lose sight as, as the reason why they're playing. So Yeah, no, I, you know, I think you hit on a lot of good points there and it's so true. Like you kind of lose your passion for the game and it turns into a job. And, you know, I think there's kind of some pros and cons to that men mentality, you know, it is a job. You have to approach it as a professional, but, you still got to find that kind of like inner kid with the passion and love for the game. And, you know, it's interesting. You mentioned the autographs It's something like I always think about, I, I, when I was going through some struggles, I'd read Jordan Tutu's book and uh, uh, David Legwan was on Ottawa at the time and, and Toots was playing in Jersey. And I, I asked like, I was like, you can introduce me to him. Like, I just want to talk to him. And like, he was so kind to me, like Jordan Tutu. And I got to meet him again because he's an Nashville alum and he came down for, you know, the outdoor game and stuff. And mm -hmm. He had said to me, like, back then, um, I think he said it in his book, too. He's like, you know, sign every autograph because when you're done playing, like, no one's going to give F who you are. Yeah. And, like, you know, that, that kind of stuff just sort of stuck with me. It's like, yeah, like, we get to do something special. Like, yeah, you know, I, I think of myself as just a normal guy, like, who plays hockey. Like, I have a, I'm no different than a plumber. I just have a different skill set, right? But, yeah. you know, I think, especially in Canada, you're elevated a bit beyond, uh, above that. So why not use that opportunity to try to maybe – pay a bit of good forward and and have a bit of a positive impact on some people yeah that's such a good perspective Go yeah ahead. i love that perspective and i think um kind of you know what i've got myself into now i definitely understand and i think you can relate to this both you can relate to this really well is you never know what kind of impact you're going to be making behind the scenes, you know, by literally just doing an article, by literally just, you know, speaking out about something, by just doing that small little piece that really doesn't take that much work. I mean, you just never know how many individuals you were really going to touch. And I really think that, you know, I, I personally, as soon as I started to, you know, read up on you, I was pumped because I was like, this is what it's all about. You know, why is this not happening more? And I think I just, I commend you so much. And I'm, I, as much as I don't know you, I'm super proud of you for what you're doing yeah. because it is super special to see that, you know, you are using that platform, um, you know, essentially for good. And, and it, as much as it helps other people, it helps you too, I'm sure. You know, everybody always said that, sharing is therapeutic and writing is therapeutic. Yes. I think it, the biggest thing is, you know, it's, it is really refreshing to get that off your chest sometimes. And it's really refreshing to go into a room with your teammates and ball your fucking eyes out sometimes. Yeah. You know, you yeah. really just need to do that sometimes. And I, yeah. I kind of relate this now to my question is, you know, how, how grateful for you are you for the relationships that you have now, because you are making these deeper connections with these vulnerable conversations that you are having yeah you, you know yeah I, I have a few things to kind of say to that and, and you know like I'll, I'll just i'll walk it back a little bit like uh, you know to commend you too like you're a young guy you're well spoken you're articulate and you've turned personal tragedy into you know positive momentum and like to me like in the grand scheme of things if this podcast helps one person saves one person who has dark suicidal thoughts like is that not worth it you know like so, I, I mean, huge props to you guys for that. Like, it's, I think that's just an interesting or, you know, a good, a good way to look at it. And, you know, I'll, I'll use like a little bit of a personal anecdote to answer your question. Like I went back and played that game in Ottawa this year and like, I played like shit. It was the hardest game of my life. You know, I was so emotional. And after the game, you know, I was super emotional and we just taken our stuff off. We were down to our gets and we were bringing our bags out. Like Ryan Johansson pulled me aside and like gave me a big hug and just like talking about how it makes me emotional now to saying it, like how proud he was of me. And like, we were both like, I was, I was in tears and, you know, I, I don't think he ever would have done that if he didn't know some of my, 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 my backstory and the things that I've gone through and that, you know, personal intense connection that we've made. And, um, you know, he didn't have to do that. Like he, he I, I like to think he did that because he cares about me and, and he knows that I care about him and that's because we've been open and honest with each other. So um, I think there's a lot of good to be had 
out of being vulnerable. Yeah. And if that doesn't happen, then you're just keeping those feelings inside. You're not really yeah. getting that. You're not getting those feelings out of you. So I think yeah. that's awesome. And props, props to him. Yeah. Um, I don't I got, have much left. I, I got, got, do you got, I got one a third? couple. Well, I got a couple more. I want to, I want to obviously, transi- else, right? yeah, I want to transition just, into, uh, kids are asleep too. So <laughs> for, <laughs> I want to transition obviously into the capital city condors eventually, but um, for our youth listening and our, you know, just any sport player listening, um, you talk about, I'll read this quote because I love this quote. Um, this summer is the hardest I've ever worked mentally. And it just felt, feels so good. I know every player says, this is the best I've felt coming into camp, but I'm not talking about skating or conditioning or anything like that. I'm just talking about me as a person. This is the best I've been feeling. How important is it for you now to have that relationship between your physical health, your mental health, your emotional health, your spiritual health, you know, coming into camp and as much as, you know, it's taken a lot of years to get to this place for you. I mean, now just talk about how fulfilling it is to be able to go into a training camp and just be like, wow, you know, I feel amazing. Yeah. You know, I think it's also intrinsically tied, right? Like it's, yeah. it's, I think your mental health is in good shape. Your physical health is going to be better and, 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 and vice versa. And there's just sort of this like synergy between them all. And, um, you know, I think for a long time, I neglected the mental health side of things. It's been like, I just got to work harder. All, you know, the answer is working harder, put my head down, work harder. Like it's just not sustainable. Eventually you reach a tipping point. Um, so, you know, like Riley touched on earlier, like I'm just in a better place as a husband, um, as a father, you know, I try to be, when I say present, like not present physically, but like present mentally, you know, as a father and a husband. And, um, you know, I just think it's a way more sustain, you know, sustainable approach to, to life and, and life as an athlete. So, um, you know, definitely just in a way better place. And I think it was kind of reflected in the year I had last year, you know, I didn't, they didn't put up a ton of points, like gooned it up a little bit, led the league in majors and PIMS. But like, I, you know, I had a really good year. My coaches loved me. My teammates loved me. Um, and I, I, I think a big part of that was just being in a good place mentally. Yeah. Do you, is there anything that sticks out to you about your summer times that you rely on in terms of like, I mean, you said you, you write and then like you, yeah. you do work, you work out a lot, but any other like modality yeah. or meditation or anything you lean on during summertime? Yeah. Uh, so working out is a big one for me. It's yeah. just, you know, like that's sort of my meditation. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it's like my happy place. Just, I just think there's something so simple about like a, a barbell, you know, it's like, it's just me versus this, this weight. I'm just going to move it. There's no, I don't have to make reads or anything, you know? So I yeah. think it's, you know, not to get too cheesy, but there's a bit of like a spiritual connection there. Um, uh, you know, an interesting one, and this doesn't apply to every, every, athletes i know may not interest guys but i actually went back to school to finish my degree um for you uh you know and i i i think it's it's kind of been empowering for me in a lot of ways like you know i left after i think it was like two and a half basically two and a half years at clarkson uh, to turn pro and i waited like 10 years and and now i have a son and you know my wife's you know very educated and she's doing her master's she's two degrees already and uh, you know, a couple of things for me were like, Hey, I don't want my son to ever look at me and be like, Oh, you dropped out of school. Like it worked for you. Like, so there was that, but then there's also, you know, I think it helps me realize that there's more to me than just ice hockey. Um, yeah. you know, I, I, I absolutely, I love to read. I love history. I've always had a passion for it. I think, you know, my grandfather fought in World War II. I think it goes back to that. So I'm like, you know what, I'm, I'm going to finish my history. And then I, I want to do my master's after. And I think, for me, that's been very empowering, um, you know, it proves to myself that I, I, I have a brain, I'm, I'm smarter than just the game of ice hockey and going out there and fighting and getting my face punched in, you know, so yeah. um, I, I, I guess, in, you know, in a lot of ways that may not be applicable to, to, to a lot of guys, but I, you know, I really encourage guys who left school early or, or, or feel like they have kind of a void in, in free time or whatever it may be, like, that's a good way, I think, to kind of like recenter yourself and realize that like, there's more to me than just the ice hockey player for sure just educating in general I don't want to sound corny I'm not like at school if if my teammates at school would have been like envisioning 10 20 years down the road and being like yeah I like if I went to them and I was like I'd like to read I like to (laughs) talk about like mental health I like they would have been like there's no chance because (laughs) it was such a different person back then but I think that's so important to just know that there's space for growth and there's space to like we have a hard schedule, but there's a lot of free time. And if you yeah. can mix in some, some books and some 
like doing a degree or even just seminars, yeah. whatever it is that interests sure. you. Like it's, uh, it is so important. Yeah. So, you know, like for us at soccer, we're on the road 41 times a year. And, and a lot of that time you're sitting in your hotel room, marinating, thinking about the mistakes you made last game or <laughs> yeah. the mistakes you don't want to make the next game. Right. And like, yeah, when you're immersed in schoolwork, like there's, especially when it's challenging, like there's no room for those negative thoughts. So yeah. I think that's been a good one for me. Yeah, yeah, and awesome. I think even to touch on, once again, Joe Hawley, what he said, you know, creating those new neural pathways in your brain is yeah. so helpful for your mindset. And, okay, so last one for me, um, this one, I, once again, I feel like I relate to you on everything, but I, this one, I once again relate to, um, I want to talk about the, you know, the Capital City Condors and, and the work you do with your wife, Tara. Um, I was super fortunate to be able to work with uh the Special Olympics in Humboldt and, you know, play floor hockey with them every Monday night. And um, as much as it was only an hour out of my week, I mean, it was honestly, when I look back, some of the fondest memories that I've ever made um, to be able to just see the pure joy on these amazing individuals' faces to just, you know, have some of their Broncos, you know, play with them for an hour out of every week was, oh, I, I, I just, it, it's, it gives me goosebumps still. It was just amazing. And I want to touch on, you know, what does this mean to you, you know, to work with such a incredible group of individuals and, you know, be able to help them, you know, just have that joy in their life. You know, what does that mean to you? Yeah. I, you know, it's very fulfilling. And I think sometimes you feel a little selfish because like you come out of it, you know, feeling like you've taken something from them, you know, like uh, it just brightens your day. Like it's, yeah. you, can't, you can't not come out of an event like that with a smile on, 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 on your face. Like it's, it's honestly, I think it's impossible. And, um, you know, obviously it's changed. My relationship with them has changed a bit, just going to Nashville and not being around. And, you know, I think they just felt a lot of those players felt so much pride in, in having a connection to the Ottawa Senators and the NHL. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think it's important for them to have this like honorary captain who's, who's in their community. And, the, you know, I, I'd really like to pass that off to a young player in, in Ottawa on the sense who I know is going to be around and be a little more present. Um, because, you know, they really take a lot of joy and, 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 and pride in having that NHL connection. And, you know, again, like there's, there's those instances where like, I just, I honestly felt selfish because I was like, I feel like I'm not doing anything and I'm getting so much out of this. Um, it really is a special community. And, uh, I, I was super fortunate that Kyle Turris asked me to get involved. I'm super fortunate that, um, you know, the Perkins, the people who run that or, or, or organization, um, welcomed me with all open arms. Yeah. And I, uh, okay, well, maybe we'll make this connection. My uh, billet brother in humble Parker Tobin, who unfortunately passed away, one of his good buddies with Park, Parker Kelly. Um, so maybe we'll oh, have okay. to, yeah, maybe we'll have to talk to, to P Kells and see if he can uh, take over the yeah. condors a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know what? I've actually, one, one of my best friends uh, is a coach in Belleville. Uh, okay. Yeah. I don't, I don't even know him. I was Ben Sexton. Um, I don't know if you want to cross paths with him. He's in the minors for a while. Yeah. I, I remember playing play. against him. Did he play in yeah. Toronto at all? Uh, no, he's like Providence, Albany, uh, Wilkes. Um, but yeah, he's a I he's a coach in Belleville and had Parker and has told me a lot of good things and I've heard nothing but good things about Parker as a kid and I got a little mad at him this year not because he was trying to trip our goalie <laughs> uh, Saros and I was, I was like I was like Parker I heard you're a good kid but like I'm gonna hurt you so <laughs> you gotta be you gotta be care careful playing the Preds because like there's you and then there's a few others that there's we a, had a, we had a couple, couple other cops where, coming around <laughs> it was like a slap shot movie a couple of times it was just like this is like what are we doing here like this is like five majors in the first period like, <laughs> yeah, I don't spots. think we yeah. had I don't think our games I think our games are relatively tame but yeah I yeah. remember watching you guys sometimes that's hilarious. yeah we I think I think the next closest team to us in majors was like 30 behind us or something <laughs> like, we had like five guys in the lineup every night who were like looking Ooh. for it we like Oh, you guys played someone. I remember uh, yeah, Minnesota. Yeah, was it Minnesota? Minnesota. Yeah, yeah, that was my yeah. that was my first game back from a concussion, and I had two majors in, in on my first two shifts. <laughs> and I think it was was it Felino too? Felino just absolutely cracked me in the eyeball with one, and then I fought Deloria after and kind of got oh, the better God, of that one. <laughs> I was like, I yeah. need to go sleep for like a month after this. Like, I was just yeah. confused. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, last. Oh, awesome. Okay, I got one more. We touched on Nashville a bit, but like I have heard nothing but like incredible things about that city, but also just like Bridgestone Arena. Like yeah. I've been fortunate, you know, going to Edmonton, you know, living through Rexall Place and going to Calgary now to the Saddle Dome, even though the Saddle Dome's 
you know, not the greatest rink in the, in the league. I mean, it's got, a lot, it's got a lot of character <laughs> and it gets loud, but like, keep, like how cool is it to play in Nashville? <laughs> yeah. It's, it's awesome. I, Riley can speak to it too. Like it's usually rocking in there. And, yeah. Um, you know, it's the fans, they, it, it's, I, I kind of like it sometimes like Vegas where it's more of just like a party atmosphere. Like, yeah. And, and it's not a knock on the fans, but I think, I think sometimes in Canada, you know, they understand the game so well that it's not as rowdy, right? Yeah. down there it's just like everyone's just drinking and having fun and it's like a night out on broadway it's part of their night right so it just turns into kind of a party and especially when you've got a team who fights as much as we do they're like bloodthirsty so like <laughs> the, 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 the fans were nuts in there like the atmosphere is unreal um it's i remember going there as a visiting player like hating playing there because it was so yeah. hard like it feels kind of like low and dark in there sometimes you know it's tough to play in and um yeah like being on the home end of it, it's, it's it's pretty awesome and are you a yeah. country music fan then too i hope not huge no oh, yeah. okay <laughs> is, that, is, that upset, is that upset you as a calgary guy or? no no well we got the stampede coming on knocking on yeah. our door on thursday here so i'm well, sure you know what like uh, it's like an undercover kind of like indie music scene there too yeah. it's like a lot of really talented artists it's definitely just a musical city but you know it's cool it's like a million people it was a million people it's exploding like kind of the same size as ottawa kind of similar vibes a little bit and uh yeah i mean it's an awesome community and, and we really enjoy playing there Wicked. No. Yeah. Riles, you got anything? No, Boro. I, that was awesome, man. I'll leave it at this. I texted Lozy uh, just to get a little, like, anything I should know or, like, what can I expect? And I think this is a good way to end it and go pump your tires a little. Because oh, I don't geez. think it can, I don't think it can get much better, better than this um, from a teammate. So he said, yeah, he's one of the most genuine guys. I know he says, He's one of the most genuine guy I know. There's his French coming <laughs> he's in. French, yeah. <laughs> uh, he goes, he's the, one of the most genuine guy I know. Always ready to help others. Great teammate. Guys love what he brings to our team on and off the ice. Fearless competitor. Solid family values. Awesome human being. So I appreciate that's that. what you got a young that kid. That, a lot, man. He was only yeah. friggin' there for a couple yeah. months, right? We gave, gave him yeah. to you guys at the deadline around. So, you know, um, like, I, I don't want to cut in, but I'll just say like, my mentor in the league was uh, Chris Kelly. Uh, he's a coach in Boston now. And, and he yeah. said to me, like, when I was kind of coming in, he's like, you know, the question to ask yourself is, like, what do you want your legacy to be when you're done? And, like, people ask your teammates about you. Do you want it to be, like, yeah, the guy was a great great guy, a great player on the ice, but he was an asshole. Like, and so, like, hearing you read that from Lozi, a, a kid who I love, um, it means a lot to me, man. Like, it gives me goosebumps and uh, – yeah, it's really special. So I really appreciate you reading that. And I'll have to give Lozzy his hundred bucks there for uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Line, yeah. Oh. yeah, well, no, that was awesome, Boro. I mean, that's great, great content there. And I, mean, yes. I respect you. I mean, I'm pumping your tires. So you just keep maybe let up a little in the corner next year or something. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a much kinder, friendlier, uh, friendlier guy. And also, you know, like we'll just leave each other alone. You just don't, you just don't like dangle me or embarrass me. Or make, make that's, not like gonna, that's not going to happen. Just, so. just don't, just don't, don't just, just don't like dash me up a couple of times <laughs> in a game. And, uh, it's all good. Yeah. Just, let me, just let me play my 13 minutes in peace and come out even. I love okay. it. All right, Boro. Yeah, I honestly, like I said before, I have so much respect for you. Uh, keep doing what you're doing. I know you're changing, uh, not so much changing, but you're, you know, you're helping move the needle, like you said. And I, that's why yeah. I have so much love and respect for you. And I will for sure be attending the Saddle Dome when the Preds come <laughs> into town. So, uh, yeah. yeah, let's get in touch for sure. Uh, we'll meet up after. So, hundred uh, percent. Like to keep in touch with you guys. I appreciate you guys having me on. If you ever want to do anything again, just let me know, man. I'm, I'm an open book and. Uh, I'm happy to help out with anything you guys got going on. So I really appreciate it. And keep up the, uh, the farm workouts. Hey, I I'm really enjoying it. <laughs> yeah. <all. laughs> yeah. Well, we're here for another month. So I'll try to post some content. So. I love it. All right, Boro. Thank you so much again. Thanks. Thanks boys.